I just want to start off by saying uh, thank you, Northside. Um, I've been here for about four months now, serving as your Connections pastor. And I just want to say thank you for how you've welcomed Brianna and I to Northside. So I really appreciate, appreciate that. About three months ago, Brianna and I got married. Uh, very exciting. And my sisters warned me that there are things that you're going to be probably divided about. You're going to do some things that she doesn't like. She's going to do some things that you don't like. And they warned me about how you fold towels, of all things. Maybe some of y'all are still going through that. Maybe it's still an ongoing battle for you. But how you fold the towels matters. They said that was their biggest fight when they first got married to my brother-in-law's. Well, Bree and I, we avoided that fight because she told me how she wanted them folded, and I did it. Um, so, but we have these things, right? We have these things that we just hang on to for whatever reason, and we get very passionate about them. Coming on staff, you, you learn about your staff members. You get to learn about their dislikes and their likes and the things that you really hold on to. And one of the biggest divisions on our staff, which I was surprised about, was chili. <laughs> is there beans in it or isn't there? And that, it's not a game. Like, I was like, oh, uh, and I was like, oh, no, this is for real. They are serious about this. So let's pull the crowd. Let's see what we're about. So we're going to, I got a couple things for us. So let's start off with chili. Are you beans or no beans? So if you're beans, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, kind of split a little bit, maybe more beans. I was going to ask one about o OU and Oklahoma State, but I don't know if the Oklahoma State fans showed up this morning. <laughs> that was brutal. Um, so Oklahoma State fans, please stay around. Don't turn off the feed. Just hang out for a little bit. What about Popeye's or Jesus chicken? Now, if you don't know what Jesus chicken is, you're probably a Popeye's, okay? So Popeye's or Chick-fil-A. If you're Chick-fil-A, where are you at? Yeah, okay. Oh, I got some Popeye's people, all right. They got a good chicken sandwich. They stepped up. Now, Justin is super passionate about this one. Gelato or ice cream? Who's gelato? Okay, yes. It was very low in the first service, too. Kind of low here as well. Okay, gelato, but you guys are a special breed. It's cool. So, but we could go on and on, right? We could go on and on with this. We could do Xbox, PlayStation, Chevy, Ford, Coke, or Pepsi, right? We could keep going on and on about these things that we're super passionate about for whatever reason, that we're getting arguments about. Now, I remember when I was about first or second grade, okay? And I don't think I was that tall, but I'm not too tall now, so. Um, but first or second grade, I remember growing up in Central Florida, you had to pick what team you were going to follow, what college team, especially. Florida State, Florida, or Miami. Now, there's a bunch of other colleges, but they didn't matter. Florida State, Florida, or Miami, you had to pick. And so, like, in first grade, I remember opening up the Atlanta Sentinel. They had the sign, go Florida State. And I was like, that's my team. I'm going to be a diehard Florida State fan. And I was super passionate. And in about second grade, I remember we were getting into groups. And my group leader was like, we're going to be the Gators. And I was like, no, we're not. I need a new group. I am not allowed to be a Gator. The Florida Gators, no, I don't want nothing to do with them. They are doing really well this season, and it's irritating. It's so frustrating. I do not like the Florida Gators or Miami. I don't want them to win ever. I want nothing to do with them. It even comes to a point where we get really obsessed about these kind of things, right? Like, for me, I don't buy Gatorade because it's made from the University of Florida. I don't want to support them. Florida State, they don't sell it on campus. If you watch a game, you probably won't because they're terrible. But if you watch a game, they have Powerade coolers instead of Gatorade coolers on the sideline. We don't want anything to do with the University of Florida. But here in 2020, as kids, yeah, they're kind of fun. And then they get more passionate, right? We get a little more serious about these things that we divide ourselves on. And we've seen a lot of that here. We've seen a lot of it even in the church. It's an us versus them mentality. And the text we're going to look at today in Mark 12, so if you haven't gotten there, go to Mark 12. We'll be in there today. We'll be jumping around a little bit, so just be ready. It says that God, or it's for Christians, okay? This text is for Christians, and it's what God has commanded us to do as followers of Christ. So if what we do, what we say, and what we think don't align with these commands, well, we've lost focus of Jesus. Now, we have been intentionally unpacking the last week of Jesus, the last few weeks. As Justin said in the video, we're going to take a pause on Mark. We're going to go in time of Advent. And we're super excited about this, about thinking about and refocusing our lives on the coming of Jesus. 
the Messiah, the King of Kings. So excited. And this is your first time doing Advent. We're excited that you're joining us. And we are just praying that God blesses this last month of 2020 as we focus on the coming of Jesus. Now, in Mark, if you've learned anything, Mark, this is what I've learned about Jesus. If he does one of two things, you're in trouble. If he asks you a question, if he tells you a story, watch out. You're in trouble. You're, something's about to go down here. And so we've seen this happen with the religious leaders, the Herodians, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. They're learning this the hard way. And as we look at this text, we're going to be focusing on one teacher of the law who, as he's been observing all these questions they've been asking Jesus and how Jesus is working his way through them, and he's actually trapping them in their own questions, he decides, you know what? I got a question. Dude, don't do it, right? Just stop. You're not going to be able to trap Jesus. Have you ever been in like a business meeting of some sort and it's going way too long? And someone's like, oh, I've got a question. You're like, dude, like, no, like, we want to get out of here. Well, that's kind of what's going on here. This religious leader's like, my turn. And so he has a question. And as we look at this, we're going to notice that this teacher of the law, this question is different. It doesn't seem like he's really trying to trap Jesus in this moment. Now, remember, it's highly probable that he was there when they were planning. Remember, they stayed up all night trying to get these questions, right? And they couldn't do it. He saw Jesus come, from, come into Jerusalem on a donkey. He saw Jesus come in and start flipping tables because he's angry. Cause he, and he accuses them of turning the temple into a den of robbers. And he's witnessed all of this. And now he's going to ask this very important question. You'll notice if you're using NIV, I'm going to be using the NLT version for our text. So just follow along with it. So verse 28, one of the teachers of the law was standing there listening to the debate. He realized that Jesus had answered well. So he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Now this question was actually, it's actually a very common question of that time. Now, we've noticed that Jesus has been given the title of teacher and rabbi. They keep calling him teacher and rabbi as you go through Mark. And this was a question you would ask a teacher of a rabbi to find out what is the core of their ministry. What do they really believe about the law? And so this question comes up here, right? Now, if Jesus knows your intent, he may not answer you the way you want. We saw in Mark 11, 27 to 33, they tried to ask Jesus where his authority comes from, what gives you the right to do the things you're doing. Well, he asked them a question in return. Because he wants to know, are you truly going to believe what I'm saying? If I say that I am the Son of God, I am the Messiah, are you going to believe it? But what do they answer? They all, we don't know the answer, Jesus. Okay. So he doesn't even give them an answer, because they would have said his baptism was from heaven. John's baptism was from heaven. And then we see in Mark 12, we see in Mark 12, uh, this series of questions, right? We've already gotten a couple. One about taxes. Who do we, do we pay our taxes? Give to Caesar what is Caesar. Give to God what is God's. Be a good citizen here and be a good citizen of heaven. And then the Sadducees come in, which this teacher of the law would have been like, man, I do not agree with the Sadducees, they, they're not with us, right? But we're going to bring them in. They try to humiliate Jesus with their question, talking about the resurrection, which they don't even believe in. They don't believe in the resurrection, but they are trying to trap Jesus in this moment. They believe in the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, okay? It's known as the Torah, and this is what they follow. And so Jesus uses it against them. He tells them they don't even know their scriptures. Well, Jesus is going to continue that here. We have this third and final question, and it's an honest question, but this isn't a question of, can I get a rankings list, Jesus, of like the commands I should follow, like 1 through 613? There's 613 Jewish laws, and what this question is, is what is the key to the other 612? Is there something at the core that we need to follow? And so we look at it in verse 29, Jesus gives them his answer. The most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment that is greater than these. Jesus responds 
to this question, but he takes it a step further, right? Not only is the greatest command love the Lord God, but there's actually one that's equally as important, but it's second to it. There's a lot of theology to break down in this, so we're going to do it pretty quick. Jesus commands us that there is only one God, and we must love that God with all of our being. Everything we do, we must love that one God that is our Lord. Now, there is a second one, and the reason why it's second, loving others, love your neighbor as yourself, is because you can do that without loving God. You do not need to love God to love other people. But for us, we must love the Lord our God with all of our being, and because of the love that God shows us, we love other people. Because God first loved us. And so how are we to love them? We're to love them as ourselves. That north side, we've shortened that. As you came in today, you probably saw on our windows, it says, love God, love others. As you're driving down the street, everyone sees it, right? Love God, love others. And Jesus knows his audience. There's a lot of different people, right? We've got Romans, Greeks, Sadducees, uh, the teachers of the law. And so here he's quoting Deuteronomy 6. He quotes Deuteronomy 6 here for the love God portion which is better known to them as the Shema. And the Shema is a prayer that they would say every morning and every night. Do you all have a prayer, like a go-to prayer, before you eat food or go to bed? Maybe it's just like a quick, like, Lord, thank you for this food, thank you for this day, amen. Let's eat, everybody. Like, that's kind of what we do, right? It becomes kind of like a little bit of like a ritual almost. Like, we're just kind of like, eh, we can do this. But here, loving God is not a ritual. Loving God is not just for Sunday mornings. It's not just for Christmas and Easter. It's not just for the times when you go to your small group or when you read your Bible or you pray by yourself. Loving God consumes who we are. Now, he would have quoted Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5, and he knew that they would have picked up on what follows. So we're going to check that out because we need to know this. So we're going to the Old Testament, everybody. Let's go. Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9. Let's check it out. And you must commit yourself wholeheartedly to these commands I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road. When you are going to bed and when you get up, tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on your doorposts of your house and on your gates. So next week, everyone needs to have love God on their foreheads, right? Don't do that. That would be weird. But loving God is not a ritual. Loving God is actionable, right? It's everything to do. It's how we glorify God. In Deuteronomy 6, we see in our hearts, our passions, our desires, in all our soul, our beliefs, what we put our trust and hope in, and all of our strength, right? Our daily life, your job, your, your hobbies. Now, in Deuteronomy 6, it stops there. Well, Jesus adds one. He adds with all your mind. And this is important because the Romans and Greeks, they have come into Jerusalem the past few centuries, and your thought mattered. They wanted to know what you thought. And so Jesus, because what do we do when we get rules? We look for loopholes. Jesus goes, there are no loopholes in this. Because if the Romans and Greeks didn't hear in mind, they'd be like, okay, I'll give Jesus all of that. I'll give God all of that, but pff, my thoughts are my own. I'm going to hold part of myself over here away from God. And so Jesus perfectly Make sure there's no loopholes. Your thoughts matter to God. Now, the word used here also for love is agape. It's agape love, right? Agape love, it has the feelings for you feelers out there of love, if you need that feeling of love, but it has to have an action behind it to be agape love. So loving God is actionable, and a way that we show this love for God is by loving others. He doesn't stop with just loving God. He ties them together to show his authority over the Torah, right? The question is, what's the heart of your ministry, Jesus? Like, if you really understand the law, what's at the heart of it? Well, it's to love God, love others. Those fulfill the 613 laws. Now, you probably didn't expect to spend a ton of time in the Old Testament today. We're going to Leviticus, right? Everybody's favorite book. Right, Leviticus 19 is where we're going to go, so go ahead and head there. If you have a highlighter, if you have a pen, we're going to look at some of these that cover our neighbor. Now, this is in a list of shall not statements, and it covers God, it covers our neighbor, and it covers our sacrifices. And so we're going to take a look at this starting in verse 9. Now, 
If you're there, uh, verse 9 is, is about your harvest. It's about your blessings. You didn't harvest the corners of your field, and you gave those to the foreigners and the poor. If anything fell off as you were harvesting, you left that for the foreigner and the poor. So that's important. Remember that. And then we start going through these shall nots that focus on our neighbor. Do not steal. Do not deceive or cheat one another. Do not defraud or rob your neighbor. Do not make your hired workers wait till the next day to receive their pay. Do not insult the deaf or cause the blind to stumble. That's just mean. Do not twist justice legal matters in favoring the poor or the rich. Do not spread gossip around your people. Do not stand idly by when your neighbor's life is threatened. Do not nurse hatred in your heart for any of your relatives. It's important to remember this week, Thanksgiving, right? Do not seek revenge or bear grudge against a fellow Israelite, but love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus is quoting from this group of commands. And it's important here because we got that first part right. I need to leave blessings for the foreigner and the poor. But at the end, don't do this against a fellow Israelite. So what does that mean for us today? Because I'm not Jewish. I don't think most of you are Jewish. And so when they hear this text, this is what they're going back to, Leviticus 19. Don't do this to my fellow Jew. Don't do this to my fellow Israelite. But remember a couple weeks ago, Justin taught about when Jesus, he comes in hot into the temple and he starts flipping tables. Why is Jesus so angry? Because the Jews have turned the temple that was designed for a place of prayer for all nations, for all people, into a den of robbers. They wanted nothing to do with the Gentiles, which if you're not Jewish, you are a Gentile. They wanted nothing to do with them. They didn't talk like them. They didn't dress like them. They didn't know their traditions. They didn't know their ways. We don't want them in here so they can go over there, and we're going to give them kind of like the terrible sacrifices so that they can be forgiven or whatever. We don't want them here, though. And their desire to do this caused so much division, and this is what is the issue. Because the question is, in all of this, who is my neighbor? Is it just for Jews to love other Jews? Today, is it Christians just to love other Christians? This question of the greatest commandment, actually, this isn't the first time it's been brought up. We actually see it in Luke 10, where an expert of religious law, he's also called a lawyer in some texts, he wanted to test Jesus. And remember, if Jesus does one of two things, you're in trouble. We're about to get both. This is awesome. So he said, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? It's a great question, right? Well, Jesus, knowing the heart of the person and the intent of the question, responds by asking him what the law of Moses says and how he understands it. The expert says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, great question or great answer. You did it. But this expert's not done. He's going to ask a follow-up question because he wants to be justified in his actions toward non-Jews. So he asks, well then, okay, Jesus, well then who is my neighbor? Well, we've heard this story before. You've heard it a lot, but I'm going to update it just a little bit. We have a Christian walking down the street. We know they're a Christian because they have their WWJD bracelet. That's super important, right? All good Christians wear it. I forgot mine, so I'm sorry. But we know they have it, but they get jumped, and they get left for dead. And they are there on the side of the road. Well, an elder of the, of the local church comes on by, and they're on their way to a meeting, and they can't be late for it. Super important. And, and they see our Christian. And they decide, ah, I, just, I don't have time for this. And they cross the street and walk on by. Next, we have, we have this woman coming down. She actually serves at a different local church than, than our fallen person. She walks up, but it's, it's 2020, right? This person is unclean. I don't know what they've got, and I can't afford to be quarantined for two weeks. So I'm going to go ahead and cross the street and walk on by. They have their justifications. They have their reasons for not helping. And lastly, a Muslim 
walking down the street. Sees our Christian in his WWJD bracelet. Doesn't walk on by. He helps him up, takes him to the hospital. And doesn't just stop there, he actually pays for the entire hospital bill. Did anyone feel a little uneasy with that? We've made this story, the Good Samaritan, to be this like super like uplifting story, but truly, when Jesus said this, he expected to ruffle some fellas, some feathers. He expected people to feel uneasy because the Samaritans, the Jews, hated the Samaritans. They were less than, they were an other, they were against us. And when Jesus says this, man, they're like, oh, okay. We even kind of see it a little bit in this expert who can't even say that it was a Samaritan that showed mercy. Jesus asks, who is the neighbor in this story? And the expert says, the one who showed mercy. Can't even say Samaritan. And Jesus says, yes, now go and do the same. And church, we must go and do the same. We cannot fall into the trap of division when we are to be about loving one another just as Jesus loved us. This isn't just for the Jews to love other Jews. It's not just for Christians to love other Christians. It's for us to love all people who have been made in the image of God. Everyone is our neighbor. As we close out this morning, we're going we're gonna to finish the rest of this conversation between the teacher of the law and Jesus there in Mark chapter 12, verse 32. This is what goes down. The teacher of religious law replied, Well said, teacher. You have spoken truth by saying that there is only one God and no other. And I know it is important to love him with all my heart and all my understanding and all my strength. And to love my neighbor as myself. This is more important than to offer all of the burnt offerings and sacrifices required in the law. Realizing how much the man understood, Jesus said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. Man, that's awesome. Jesus tells him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. Church, when you share the love of Jesus, when you share the good news of Jesus with someone, you are not far from the kingdom of God. When you serve on mission trips, uh, Northside goes to Honduras and Mexico, and you serve those people and you love on them, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And when you raise the amount of money we raise for Feed My Starving Children, I'm excited for you all to hear the total of that. You're not far from the kingdom of God. When you serve our local community, by helping give them some kind of normalcy when they may not have been able to have a Thanksgiving dinner in this crazy year, man, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And when you choose to love the least of these, when you choose to not let division rule your heart anymore, and you love someone who's an other that you don't fully understand, you're not far from the kingdom of God. I can't wait to hear... Jesus, face to face for the first time whenever I get to heaven. Good and faithful servant. You loved God. You loved others. And you followed me. Because that's how we inherit the kingdom of God. This teacher of the law is told that he's not far from the kingdom of God. Loving God, loving others, those are great things. But he hasn't chosen to follow Jesus yet. And I hope he did. We don't find out anything else about this teacher of the law, what he decides to do. But I truly hope that he decided, you know what? I'm going to follow Jesus and inherit the kingdom of God. So church, we're going to sing another song. We hope you stand up and you sing loud and you give all praise to Jesus. But we're going to be a church that strives to love God, love others, And when we accept to follow Jesus, inherit that kingdom of God. Lord, I just thank you for today. I thank you for 
your teachings. I thank you for the love that you showed us, that you decided that, you know what, I love these people so much that I'm going to become a human and I'm going to die for them. Lord, let us love others the way that you loved us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.